On May 10th, 1869, in the town of Promontory, Utah, a single act changed the United States forever. With a swing of his hammer, former California Governor Leland Stanford drove in the final spike at last uniting America's East and West. The Transcontinental Railroad was finally complete, forever opening the door to California. Millions would soon make the trek. Now, more than 130 years later, California is a very different place. Where one million people once lived in Leland Stanford's day, 37 million now make their homes, and the growth continues. We grow at the rate of about five million people every 20 years. And if you look at where these five million people every 20 years are gonna live and work, they're gonna increasingly uh, organize themselves away from the traditional central cities into, into some new cities in the suburban areas. In California, the current population growth rate is equivalent to creating a new city the size of San Jose every two years. It's a problem that simply will not go away. The demand for travel is increasing. Our resources are very limited. It's very unrealistic to be to, to expect that we're gonna double or triple the size of our airports or triple or double the size of our freeway system. So the only thing that's left is build something that has the capacity of a 12-line freeway. For the California High Speed Rail Authority, that something would be a state-of-the-art train system linking the Bay Area to Los Angeles and San Diego. Going at 220 miles an hour allows us to make the door-to-door, uh, station-to-station, downtown-to-downtown San Francisco to Los Angeles at two and a half hours. And that is, of course, much faster than an airplane and about three times as fast as an automobile. They're electric, they're very clean, they're very quiet, they're very comfortable, and they're extremely safe. California's high-speed rail, which would be funded by a bond measure scheduled to appear on ballots in 2008, is not a radical new idea. It's based on the same technologies that are used for high-speed rail systems in numerous locations throughout the world. It's a proven system. Japan, for example, have been running for 40 years with these trains. They've done over six billion miles without a single fatality, not one. In France, just before Christmas, they celebrated 25 years of running at 200 miles, 187 to 200 miles an hour, uh, without one single fatality. The core technologies that would be employed by the system are orders of magnitude more advanced than those used on standard speed trains. From a purely engineering and construction point of view, it will be, when it's built, the biggest single infrastructure project ever built in the United States. So it's enormous. And the challenges for the civil engineer and the mechanical engineer are huge. Although visually similar to its low-speed cousins, nearly every element of a high-speed train presents extreme technical challenges. Normal trains in the United States are limited to a top speed of 79 miles per hour. Once you start to move at speeds approaching 200 miles per hour, simple physics becomes the enemy. The overhead wires, called the catenary system, are a good example. The power for the train itself comes from the 25,000 volt overhead wire system. And it's actually one of the more exotic parts of the technology. In effect, what you have is a collecting bar across the top of the train and a wire running along it. If you were to line those up, you've created a perfect saw. It would cut right through the top of the train in effect, or the pantograph they call it. What has to happen is that wire actually has to go back and forth at a very constant rate to keep the heat and the friction down but it has to have perfect contact. Even the quaint clacking of the tracks and the swaying of the train's cars present potential safety threats. To keep the tracks as smooth as possible, they're welded into a single continuous ribbon, but that alone isn't enough. In the industry, we talk about a train seeking, it going from side to side, trying to find its comfort zone between the rails. Generally what you have is two running rails that aren't perfectly distanced apart. And basically what's happening is the train's always trying to find the bottom. You can't tolerate that on high speed. That would not work. You would have a very difficult problem with the train 
uh, that could cause severe safety problems because the heat and the friction generated by seeking, by the steel rubbing against the steel would not be acceptable. So that's why the real magic and the real mystery of the development and what's cherished by the industries is this profile between the wheel and the rail. This perfect interface helps to make the ride amazingly smooth. But unlike typical in-city rail systems, high-speed trains are surprisingly slow to start and stop. The real essence of high-speed rail is not necessarily its acceleration and its deceleration, like we would have with a transit system. It's to get up to a speed and maintain that speed for very long periods of time. So what you really want from high speed is to not stop. And when they do stop, the sheer mass of the train combined with its speed presents another set of problems. One of the black arts of high-speed rail, believe it or not, is the braking system. It is probably one of the most highly guarded secrets uh, of any manufacturer. They have special shops that do nothing but work on the brakes that cause the train to stop properly. As exciting as the high-speed rail system is, there are still some significant hurdles. Debate continues on the route, with some experts advocating the Central Valley 580 corridor to Oakland, and others pushing for use of the Pacheco Pass, roughly along Route 152. It's even possible that both routes will be used. But as it turns out, determining the route may not be the biggest obstacle. The easiest thing to do is to get between LA and the Bay Area. The biggest challenge in my mind is getting out of the LA Basin. You're going to have to build a substantial tunnel system through natural gas fields, through seismically active areas. Uh, there's who knows what you're going to run into. Even if all of the technical and political issues are solved, that doesn't guarantee California's new high-speed rail system would succeed. The technology's there, the right-of-way is basically there. Uh, the High Speed Rail Commission's done a pretty good job on the analysis. Um, I, I think the real big obstacle over the long term is, uh, is whether people are going to use the system. With a total price tag of over $30 billion, the new system isn't cheap. How attached are Northern Californians to commuter air travel? And how open are they to change? It may not just be a question of comfort. Considering a single 747 ascending to cruising altitude uses enough fuel to power the average passenger car for a year, the clean efficiency of electrical energy may be a factor in and of itself. For Robert Doty, it's a question of experience, both personal and cultural. One of the things that I found when I went to the uh, United Kingdom to, to work on the high-speed rail project was that they considered the United States a developing country when it came to rail transportation. They said, you have not progressed your technology. We, the rest of the world has surpassed you in so many ways. That was a shock, but unfortunately, it's also true. We have not invested in a device, in a system that we can use within the United States and with our technology. We're stuck about 100 years ago. The biggest problem in the United States is we need the first one. And when people see the first one and experience the first one, they're going to say to themselves, why have we waited so long? It just makes so much sense. And I don't see airport travel getting any better. I think it'll only get worse. So why not do this? Instead of building another runway, why not do something like this? Yeah. Someday. Ultimately, the question is whether Californians are willing to modify their long-standing relationship with the passenger car and reestablish their historical love affair with rail. If all goes according to plan, it's a question that will be answered by voters in 2008.